The Reaper 6.47 update came out last Friday on the same day as my 6.46 video. And in this video, we'll be looking at changes to media items, media explorer, rendering, and much more. If you ever feel like you're falling behind on any of these new changes or features, click the link in the description below. There's a playlist that has all the changes going all the way back to Reaper 5.0 and uh, you will learn a ton. There's so many great tips and things in there. We're gonna start this off with changes to the action list, improve performance of large number of custom actions, and increase maximum number of custom actions and rescripts. And in practice, that just means that searching is going to be faster. So if I search for color, it's instantaneous. Search for track, search for transport, you spell it right. It's just much quicker than it used to be. And the maximum number of custom actions and scripts that we can have saved with Reaper has been expanded. Yeah, so just a really small thing that will speed up working with the action list. For the CPU metering, add option to view CPU utilization as 1.0C equals one core fully utilized. So rather than overall percent of usage, we can have it as a number for a single core being filled. We'll find this in the effects chain and performance meter menus. So here's the performance meter. If I right click, I can display CPU utilization as percent for all cores or as a number for one core. So currently got this saying 0.5% CPU. I can switch it to cores. The effects are using zero of a full core. <laughs> so uh, let's go back to looking at the average 0.2 cores, and if I switch over 2% total, it's about 3%. So if I have an effects chain open, I can go to the options menu and then CPU utilization display, display it as percent or as, as cores. For the Mac version specifically, there's a couple changes. Improve performance of bridged plugins, refresh various controls when switching to and from dark mode. Run media anticipative effects worker threads in real time audio work group if time critical priority is set. With a hint, maybe useful for M1 Pro CPUs. And if we look at this in the Reaper preferences, we're looking at the thread priority, having this on highest or time critical may make a difference. If you have an M1 chip, M1 Pro Max, they have different uh, high efficiency and performance cores, and this may make a difference in how those are actually used. So definitely worth checking out and see if your projects run better with highest or time critical options. And now we'll look at some changes for the Media Explorer. Add customizable toolbar, add action to show and hide toolbar, move insert media, autoplay, start on bar controls to default toolbar, Actions to tempo match, half speed, or double speed act as toggles. Action to show media properties will display properties for last selected item if there's no current preview media. And they've added an optional media information box. And here's the newly updated Media Explorer. You'll notice that some of the default controls for autoplay, for tempo matching, things like that, have been removed from the main transport bar and those buttons have been moved up to the default toolbar, which you'll find at the top. I assume that they've been removed from there just to enable us to have a more compact Media Explorer for different layouts. So this toolbar can't be really swapped with any other toolbar at this time anyways. There isn't secondary custom Media Explorer toolbars like you would see with the MIDI editor. Uh, we do have the option of positioning this docked in the Media Explorer floating in a toolbar docker or close it entirely. We have the insert button, uh, show media information, autoplay, start on next bar, tempo matching, so three buttons for that. I've turned on the tempo match function, and then I can switch that to 2x or half and turn it off again by just clicking on this first one or off. As long as all three of these buttons are off, the original tempo of your media will be used. We've got the keep pitch button, and then docking the Media Explorer. You can also customize this and add more functions to this. For example, a custom action to insert on a new track. Let's put that over by the other one. Right click to change the icon. Yeah, I guess just that one would be fine. 
what that would look like if I got an item selected here. I could insert that. That's added. And then this other button will add that on a new track below. Yeah, so this custom toolbar can be really useful. And if you want, you can remove it entirely. Let's just close that. And then in the action list for the Media Explorer section, there are things like Show Media Explorer Toolbar, and that will bring that toolbar back. It would have been nice to have those original functions still there as optional, just something you can hide and not force you to use the toolbar if you don't want to use the toolbar. But yeah, but for people that don't ever work with loops, this is nice because it's a more compact view. And if we have a look down at the bottom preview area, we've got this media information section, which is essentially giving the same information as when we do the um, show media properties. It's essentially this, but in a window that can be just permanently there in the Media Explorer. This is going to show whatever is in the previewed media item. There's a small change for media item properties. Double click always resets volume to unity or pan to center. So I've got some items in the timeline here and I've already changed their volumes and panning. So I'm just gonna double click. I think there might be a minor bug here. I can see that the values are resetting and if I apply this, they move, but you would expect to see this uh, volume control move automatically. Maybe that's intentional, but it doesn't look quite right. For media items, add action to calculate loudness of selected items, not including effects or track settings. So if we search the action list for calculate loudness, we'll see two new actions here. Uh, calculate loudness of selected items via dry run render and calculate loudness of selected items, including take and track effects and settings via dry run render. So the first one would be just the item. So if I run this, we'll see that it's LUFS of minus 25. And let's, let's set this volume to minus six on the track. And we'll run this, including take and track effect settings via dry run render. And now this is minus 31, exactly six dB below the previous one. So now we can calculate the loudness of the entire mix just within the time selection, uh, just the selected items, just the selected items through the tracks that they're on, calculate loudness of the tracks via dry run render, so every item on the track, calculate loudness of selected tracks within the time selection, or calculate mono loudness of selected tracks within selection. Pretty cool. For the menus and toolbars, replace save close buttons with OK, cancel, and apply. So basically, if you know the three buttons here in the preferences, we're now going to see that in some of the other areas of Reaper, namely the customize menus toolbars window here. So if we're customizing a menu or a toolbar, let's say main options, we've got a custom toolbar, maybe we remove something, now we see OK, Cancel, and Apply. Apply will save the settings to the toolbar menu file and keep this window open. Cancel will close the window and not save your changes. And OK will save your changes and close this window. And by the way, that saves into reaper-menu.ini. In the MIDI editor, move edit cursor on actions to navigate to previous or next note. So if I have some notes here in the MIDI editor and I wanna to jump to the next one, I'm gonna press the tab key to do that. Uh, I believe that's a default, it may not be. As I do that, instead of just the notes being highlighted, the edit cursor actually moves to those notes. And I press shift tab to go backwards in time through the notes. And so those actions are navigate, select next note, and navigate, select previous note. Next, we're gonna look at razor edits. Display envelope value when editing in addition to percent change. So we've got volume envelope and I'll just put in a razor edit. And if I use the trim function here, the tooltip will say the envelope volume, the amount in decibels that it's at, as well as the amount that you've just changed. And so the same happens for panning. I'll do the same. So it's now at 52% left. But this also works for effects. So if I 
add in re-EQ, and I'll just touch a parameter, go to param menu, show track envelope, and close this. If I have a razor edit on this, and I move this, we see envelope gain low shelf re-EQ minus 2.8 dB, and it's the 2.6 change. What happens if we have a razor edit across multiple envelope lanes? It will display for whatever one you're touching. So if you touch the volume, the tooltip will be for the volume for the EQ, or it will be for the pan, but they will all move together by the same percentage that you're moving. And so the difference there is just instead of showing only the percent, it's now showing decibels as well. There are a couple changes for rendering. Add checkbox to only normalize files that are too loud. Add menu items under render dialog stats button to change which render statistics are displayed. So let's go to the render window and look at the normalize function. And in here, if we enable normalization, we can actually set it so that only the loud files get normalized down, which is pretty cool because we don't always want to push everything up or only push everything down. We may only want to normalize the files that are louder than the others. So there's a perfect option right there. And when we render something, and we go to the stats button here, we have this option, calculate statistics when rendering. We've got these three options, true peak, LUFS I, LUFS M, loudness range, LUFS short term. So we can enable or disable any of those. And those are actually the same settings as you'll find in the preferences under audio rendering, calculate statistics when rendering. It's the same options here. And lastly, we're gonna look at some things for video editing, add project time offset variable, fix incorrect restart of peaks building when editing projects during peaks build, and they've improved the text overlay preset to display time code, fit the background to the text, and changed the defaults. So let's start off with that middle one, that bug fix. If you import a video file and it starts building the peaks to display the waveforms, do a little edit to that, change the start time or something like that, then that would restart building the peaks over again. And with those large video files, sometimes that takes a lot of time. This is actually a really old bug. But now that's fixed, now it won't be interrupted in that way, which is great. Project time offset variable. I'll show you a very simplistic example of this. First, what is the project time offset? Let's park my cursor at 16 seconds and open up project settings. In here, we can set the project start time, uh, set zero to edit cursor, and so hit that. And so now our project offset is minus 16 seconds. And you can see in the ruler, this is now zero, and it's negative numbers to the left, positive numbers to the right. I will insert the video processor, and I'll paste in some video processor code that I saved earlier, Command S to save it. And using this code, we can generate some text showing the project offset in seconds. Let's go to bar 97 and set that to the edit cursor which is three minutes and 12 seconds or 192 seconds. I'm just generating this text as an example of, you know, that it exists. You probably wouldn't generate the number. You probably use the number as a part of a calculation within the video processor. So let's look at the new text overlay preset, which is overlay text timecode. This replaces the previous one. We do need some text or something here. Let's actually move this to an, an item and we'll automatically get the name. So the default text will now look like this. And if we go down to the last parameters here, we've got show time code, set that to one or on, and now it's showing the time code. And that will update as this plays. This will follow things like the frame rate properly or should. And if it's drop frame time code, there's a, a little toggle for that as well. Fit background to text. Let's turn that from zero to one. And now that automatically fills in uh, a little rectangle around. And yeah, just going by what's in the change log, those are the changes that I've noticed here. We can add a little bit of a pad around that, change the text color or change the text brightness, the opacity, the background opacity, so that's a really easy way to generate a time code overlay on your video, which helps, you know, if you're working on projects with other people, that helps people reference the correct frames.
If you are editing videos, I would highly recommend using my presets instead because you get options like changing the background size, background colors, you can change the opacity of the background, you can add a drop shadow, you can change the length of the drop shadow, change the text color, you can choose from 13 different fonts, whatever you want to do. And just overall, it's just a lot easier to use and it looks nicer. So that's it for what's new in Reaper 6.47. Not a ton of major stuff, but important things to note, I think, especially the changes in the Media Explorer. If you weren't expecting things like that, that could probably throw you off guard. But lots of nice things overall. Nice update. Thank you so much for watching. Please subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. Follow me on Facebook and Twitter. Support the Reaper blog through Patreon and visit reaperblog.net for a lot more tutorials.